Karl Popper wrote, depending upon how you count things, something like 11 substantial books, and this is not to mention his many other works like philosophy articles and separate essays, that he also wrote, or is at least credited with, some works being compiled, edited and published after his death. Popper is renowned by many, but not enough, and denounced by some, which are too many, for his clarity of thought and his criticism of many ideologies and other philosophies. It is this clear-sighted criticism of various deeply entrenched philosophies in academia that could be one reason why he is not so popular in universities as he should be. Or where he is not ignored completely, his contributions can sometimes be minimised. We could of course spend many hours extolling his philosophies and summarising his ideas, but the task I have set myself here and now is to reveal to you what I think are some central points of his epistemology that inform his broader philosophy. There are four insights I wish to begin with, all related and all of which feed into the work of his intellectual successor, David Deutsch. 1. Popper's epistemology concentrates upon making progress and improving the human condition through improving our ideas by revealing what is wrong with existing structures rather than showing any of them to be right or justified. This is a key insight. And we may quibble over whether others got there first in the ancient Greek tradition or elsewhere, but Karl Popper really did systematise and argue for this negative view in epistemology. In science, he famously observed that should an idea not be testable, then it was not science. This is known as the falsification criterion. He never argued, we must emphasise, that unfalsifiable theories are worthless. Quite the opposite, for his own philosophy was not testable scientifically, but rather that the traditional game of assuming that knowledge was either deduced from axioms already known, or assumed true, or induced by repeated observations in the world, was wrong. Science is distinguished by testability, the capacity for a theory or hypothesis to be falsified, shown wrong, refuted and thus ruled out in favour of some better idea. And this leads to the related idea of 2. We are simply looking for the best idea the idea that solves our problem. Our project, whether in science or morality or history, is not to find the provably true idea. We are seeking instead, to some extent, the fittest idea for a problem situation at any given time. Popper's great work, Objective Knowledge, is subtitled An Evolutionary Approach, for good reason. Once we find a solution to our problem, we do not assume that the solution will work for all time. Our situation may change, and our ideas will need to adapt. This does resemble something of how biological organisms are fit given a particular environment. But should the environment change, and the organism fail to adapt, to be precise, the genes fail to be replicated, then it will die. And so too with ideas. They are the best we have at the time, not the ultimate truth. We should reject claims to ultimate, final truth not least because those who do make such claims are often at loggerheads. Which brings me to three. There is always a third way. False dichotomies lurk everywhere. And of course, the concept of a false dichotomy, the idea that only this or that is possible, was known even to the ancients. But what Karl Popper did was have a strong theme running deeply through his works that revealed how often we are presented with false dichotomies. And what was needed instead was a third way, a better way. If so-called induction could not produce certain knowledge in science, then how could we be confident of scientific discoveries? Either we have certainty or we lack confidence. Popper rejected this false dichotomy and completely upended the idea that we should seek certainty or justifications for our theories and instead concentrated upon how it is that we make progress instead, by a critical means, by ruling out falsehoods. In democratic systems, given that the majority might form a mob, should we therefore install a kindly philosopher as a tyrant? Who should rule? Majorities or kings? Popper rejected that whole false dichotomy. There is a third way. Democracy is about how to remove rulers, not answering who should rule. And so this leads us to four, Popper's anti-authority stance. And although this may be controversial, I admit I am speaking for myself when reading, for example, his own intellectual autobiography, Unended Quest, a deep theme is a rejection of authority on many fronts. The supposed authority of empiricism, namely that nature tells you what is true that the knowledge is there to be read from the book of reality. 
This is rejected. The idea that scientists themselves are also authorities in whom we should place our trust or whose theories we should believe or that governments are there to act as all-knowing rulers. Now, the proper stance is to be sceptical whenever authority is claimed. The question is, by what mechanism can you know? A scientist should not be believed, but questioned. And when the questions are answered well, then society should act. Not because of any authority of the scientist, but because, objectively, the knowledge they claim solves our problem. And that is an objective matter which makes Popper a realist and a defender of truth. Karl Popper's philosophy stands as an objective, realistic bulwark between two terrible, tyrannical, alternative epistemologies. On the one hand, relativism, the rejection of reality and truth and objectivity, and on the other, dogmatism, the embracing of a revealed truth or a final truth. The third way that Popper marks out for us allows for continual, rapid improvement. But for more on this, we have to go to the next part of this series about David Deutsch's advances on Popper.